Welcome to the New Day Community Church Sermon Podcast. We hope you are encouraged by this message from the Nichols Road Campus. For more info, look us up at newdaycommunity.org. New series, well, we're not starting one because Cameron started it last week, and it's called Healthy Relationships. And today, uh, I'm going to talk about work. Uh, doesn't everybody love work? Woohoo! Yeah, not quite the applause, you know? <laughs> Um, so it, what's interesting is I, I was in the airport last week. I went to visit my aunt in Florida and while I was sitting in the airport, my flight got canceled. And so it was the next morning and there was this young gal uh, and I found out she's 24. She was talking to this other couple and she said, I just don't understand why all the people my age don't want to work and nobody wants to work. And and she was just talking about it, and I thought, well, that's really interesting, you know? It's interesting that she would, would pick up on, on that. And I, um, I, I was like, well, I'm going to be talking about, oh, it buzzed at me because I'm going the wrong way. Um, so I, I started thinking about my work history, like when I was what age? And it's interesting that we're talking about this on Father's Day because I remember from a young age, I, I got my first job when I was 15. And one of the reasons I learned work ethic, I believe, was because I saw how hard my dad worked. And I saw him toil really, really hard because, um, for some of you who don't know, my father is deaf. And there is a lot of prejudice against people with disabilities. And today, in the world that we live in, we're much more accepting of people with disabilities to work. But at that time, it was very difficult for a deaf person to get a job because nobody wanted to hire somebody they couldn't communicate with. And my dad worked really hard. And I remember going and seeing him sit at his desk one time and and he was trying to do his bills, and he's like, I just don't know how I'm going to pay for them. And I remember thinking, work is good because you can pay your bills, right? That's a good thing. And, um, but if you are a Christian, we, it's more than just paying your bills that we work, right? So in, in the beginning, okay, so I am doing this wrong. Sorry. In the beginning, in Genesis, we, we read this pa passage, the Lord God took man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. From the very beginning, God says, you're going to work. And it's a good thing to work. L later in Acts, we learn that Jesus gives a command to his disciples right before he ascends into heaven he says this, but you will receive power from the Holy, when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, all of Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, that we are his witnesses. And I was reading this commentary by author um, Bill Peel, and he said those four areas that Jesus talked about were significant. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. Jerusalem represented to those people, the people that were culturally and geographically close to them, their family, their neighbors, their work associates. Judea was similar in a culture, but they were geographically distant. So people in Detroit as versus Kalamazoo, but we were the same uh, the same culture. But Samaria represented people that were culturally different, but geographically within reach. So you think of a culture within Kalamazoo that's different from you. We're to reach them. That's our Samaria. And to the ends of the earth, those that are culturally and geographically distant, short-term missions, global missions, those kinds of things. But the first one he lists is Jerusalem, your family, your friends, and your work associates. That we've been given a call to not only work, but to witness to those at work. 
So in the beginning, uh, oh wait, sorry. <laughs> and um, God models this for us when he created the heavens and the earth, right? He created for six days and then he rested. And then he gives that model to us in the, in the Old Testament over and over again. You see where God says you work for six days and then you rest. Not because for any other reason than it's good for you to rest, right? God cares about you. He says it's good for us to work and it's good for us to rest. And so that's it. There's 350 verses just about work. Did you know that? 350 verses about work. So I, it's something that's important to God. But how do we work? What do we do? Boy, you guys can't see that very well, can you? Oh, you can. Okay, I just can't. Okay, good. All right. <laughs> just checking. <laughs> okay. Um, so we need to work and give our work unto the Lord. In Colossians 3, 23 and 24, it says, work willingly at whatever you do, as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. Remember that the Lord will give you an inheritance as your reward, and that the master you are serving is Christ. David Guzik is a, a commentary that I read. I, I really like him. And he says, you know, when you're reading this, first of all, one of the people groups that he was speaking to were slaves. Now, don't think slaves like the American slaves, but a, a lot of two, times in the Old Testament or in the New Testament, they were talking about slaves who had sold themselves into servitude because of debt or whatever, and they were treated well most of the time. And, but he's saying, even as a slave, you need to work willingly. You need to give your work willingly. And um, David Guzik says, in this passage is really clearly saying that there's no guarantees that things are going to be fair at work. Has anybody been in a workplace that's not fair? Anybody seen um, bad workers be promoted and good workers get fired? But we're still working unto the Lord because Paul here assures us that the final reward is going to be fair and it's going to be according to God's standard and he's going to give it to us. So whether things are working out well or not, we need to be working as if God was sitting right there because he is. He's right with you. If you're a Christian, if you're a believer, well, even if you're not, he sees everything, but if you're a Christian and you're a believer, he's with you. So what you do at work matters. Your attitude. You know, and I'm just going to get real practical. When you go to work, do you show up on time? Do you leave early and not and, and kind of scam the, the system? Do you print copies at work when you're not supposed to? Do you follow the rules even when no one else does? Are you willing to go the extra mile and serve your coworkers because that's what God tells us we should do? Those are hard things. But all of those things really add up to your integrity. I have to be really honest. As I was preparing for this, it was very difficult because even as a Christian, when I worked um, and I'm not, I started when I was 15. I'm not going to tell you how long I worked because <laughs> that would give you some clues to things that I don't want you to know. Um, so when I started working, and, and I, when I started working at 15, I wasn't a Christian. And then when I became a Christian, I, I, you know, I'm going to give you an illustration. I, I was reading this illustration. This guy said he was young and um, he broke a mirror and he thought, well, I'll glue it back together and nobody will know I broke it. Well, okay, so he was young, right? So if you've ever taken a mirror and broke, it, it, it had broken into six pieces and he glued it back together, and then when he looked at it, instead of seeing one self, 
he saw six selves. That was very much how my beginning walk was. I had my work self, I had my home self, and I had my church self. And heaven help me if somebody from work showed up at church, because they would have seen somebody different. That's not good. That's not good. And, and I share that with you because it's very easy to slip into a work self. It's very easy to do what everybody else is doing. It's very easy to complain about work. Anybody ever complain? You don't have to raise your hand. <laughs> I, 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 I can't say that this year I didn't complain. The pandemic was very difficult for, for uh, lots of jobs. And complaining should be done to the Lord, not to your coworkers. Because what example are you showing that is a Christian? You know, we need to merge that six pieces of the mirror back into one and be who you are before the Lord, whether you're at home or at work or here at church. In Proverbs 16, it says, commit your work to the Lord. And so maybe for some of you, I, I had to Google this because I wasn't sure. What, what's the right term for a stay-at-home mom? I like the term homemaker because that's what she does. She makes a home for her family. And some of you women in the, or, or men, you work and you take care of the home. You have two jobs. Your children, I, I love Kurt. Kurt during the pandemic <laughs> had coworkers in his office. His coworkers were about this tall. And I and I love and I was thinking about that as I was preparing this. And you know, if you're working at home, because you are working at home, you have coworkers watching if you have little kids at home. They're seeing your integrity. They're seeing your work ethic. They're seeing how you behave yourself. What kind of a model are you showing? Is your integrity intact? So being a good steward is important. But we need to remember, be a witness in our workplace. So how do we build relationships? In, in Philippians 2, it says... So he, he's talking and he's saying, then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, working together with one mind and purpose. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others better than yourselves. I'm going to stop for just a second. So Paul's writing to the Philippians, but he's saying this to the church somebody might say. But if we're going to be that same person at church and at work, we can apply these principles. Now, we don't want to be, um, be one-minded with those at work, especially if they're not Christians. But we should not be selfish. We should not be trying to impress others. We should be humble thinking others, of others better than ourselves. And don't look out for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. And a couple verses later, he says, Christ Jesus humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Have you humbled yourself in obedience to God? when it comes to your work? Or are you out there striving doing it on your own? It's real easy to slip into that. The thing is, how you behave represents Christ in your workplace. Being a good steward, not complaining, doing your work unto the Lord, being ethical, having integrity, people see that. Your coworkers will see that. 
but you also need to interact with your coworkers. You can't plant seeds in the hearts of those around you if you don't talk with them. Right? I mean, how do you build a relationship with one another if you, if you isolate yourself? I, I was challenged um, a couple of years ago. Does anybody remember when we had Curtis Hines here? He was talking about evangelism, right? And I, at that particular time, I was avoiding the lunchroom because I had several coworkers that, oh my goodness, not only did they complain, but did they gossip? Holy cow, gossip about everybody and people that I liked. And then I kept thinking, well, geez, I wonder what they say about me, right? And so I started avoiding the lunchroom. And I remember Curtis Hines saying, why do you expect heathens to behave like Christians? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> You mean heathens might gossip? You mean they might complain? And if they're not following Christ, who are you to judge them? Who are you to call them out? They're not living along the same standard as, as you. And I was like, ooh. And how am I going to be a witness if I have no relationship with them? I had to do a lot of praying about that one. Like, how, how do I sit in this room? Because that's where Jesus would go, right? Jesus didn't hang out at the temple only. He went to where the people were, where the sinners were. How do I represent him well? I have to have a relationship. I have to build a relationship with them. Cameron talked, Pastor Cameron talked last week about communication. And you know, the key to good communication, first and foremost, is to listen. But not only listen to what they say, but listen to their heart. Because the Bible says, out of the heart come, speaks the mouth, right? The things that come out of your mouth are coming from your heart. So not only do you need to check your heart and what you're saying, but you need to, add, to listen to their heart. Are they complaining because they're just so lonely or isolated or feeling like they're overlooked? I, I don't want this to be... I, I've had a few times where I've done some really amazing things. I wish I could say I did it every day while I was at work. That's not the case. But there's a few times where I heard someone's heart and I'd say, you know what? You are so good at what you do. I am? Yeah, I've been in your classroom and I think I've seen you teach. I've seen you reach kids and it's amazing. Wow. And you see them light up. Isn't that what Jesus would do? Right? I'm building a relationship. I'm listening to their heart. I'm speaking into the areas that they may be lacking in. Listening to them and listening to the Holy Spirit. There was one time that I was walking through the, uh, so I work at a school. I should have said that first. I work at a school. I'm not a teacher. I get to work in teacher classrooms. I was walking through the main office and there was a secretary who just looked so forlorn. And I was like, oh, what, what's going on? And, and she said, oh my gosh, I, I, my, I don't even remember, honestly. I don't remember what it was. And she said, I have to fly and I'm so terrified. And without even thinking where I was standing and what I was doing, and no, this is not a Christian school, I said, could I pray for you? And she looked at me and she, and she said, oh yeah, or actually she, she just said, oh yeah. I said, could I pray for you right now? Okay. I said, could I, could I take your hand? Okay. <laughs> and then I prayed and I closed my eyes. And when I opened my eyes, she had tears streaming down her face. Yes. I listened to the Holy Spirit. I did what he asked me to do. 
I haven't always done that. But those are opportunities to build relationships, to sow seeds of what Christians do. You care. Jesus cares. I want people to know that I care. One time, this uh, a coworker was, we, we would sit next to each other during a, a planning time, and I would feel the Lord, or I would have read a devotional and just been so inspired by it. I would chat with her about it and just say, you know, I was reading in my Bible today about this, and isn't that cool? Isn't that great how God did this thing or how he did that thing? And, and she just... She would say, oh, that's really neat. That's really neat. I did that for like five years. Five years. Not every day. Like, not even every week. Okay? I'm going to be honest. You know, it would just come up every so often. But five years later, she hit a crisis. And she came and she said, Kathy, I need you to pray for me. Whoa. That I had not expected. But I had sown seeds. I'd watered them. I haven't seen it harvested yet. But I was faithful. I wish I'd been faithful with more. Working with people, you're going to have conflicts. Anybody ever had conflicts? Anybody ever have conflicts at work? We need to use the biblical principle of going to that person. Now, I, I will admit there was one time this person, oh my good night. I would go home and complain to my husband. I should have been complaining to God, but I complained to him, poor guy. And she had done something and I was just so annoyed And it had continued on and on and on. And finally, one day, I went to my boss. (laughs) Fortunately, I have a a pretty uh, wise boss. And she said, yeah, that that sounds really that, you know, yep, I I know that she can be that way. So what are you going to do about it? (laughs) What do you mean, what am I going to do about it? I'm talking to you. (laughs) And she said, yeah, well, so how are you going to handle that? How are you going to talk to her about that? So I ended up having a conversation with her. And of course, it was a miscommunication and it was seeing things differently. And but I don't like conflict. I don't like going and talking to people about conflict. It's hard. And yet it's what we're supposed to do. Right. It's what we're supposed to do. I remember this one person who I was really good friends with. She's a Christian. I'm a Christian. We had been talking about something, and I shared what she had told me because I didn't realize, and it, didn't, it doesn't matter, I didn't realize that she didn't want me to tell anybody else. Workplace 101. Somebody tells you something, keep it to yourself. I, you, because what you're doing is gossiping. Even though... I, I don't think my heart was to gossip. I really don't. I think I was just sharing that, hey, this situation's happening, so give her a little grace. She said, you know, hey, can I, can I see? I, uh, oh, I hate. Does anybody ever? Somebody says to you, hey, I need to talk to you. Can we meet next week? Who loves that? <laughs> you need to talk to me. Do it right now. <laughs> and if it's next week, don't tell me until next week. <laughs> No, my head goes crazy. I dream up stuff for a week. I've got myself so freaked out. So this was only the next day, thank goodness. But she said, you know, I, I, I got to talk to you. She said, and she sat me down and she said, I told you X. I didn't expect you to tell anybody else. That was my business. That wasn't yours to share. And I was like, I, because I love her. I didn't want her to be upset with me. Fortunately, she did that. That was a long time ago. I've gotten better. (laughs) I learned that lesson because that conflict was good for me. That conflict brought me to learn something that I needed to learn. 
in Romans 12, 18, it says, do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Do all that you can. There's a lot you can do to live in peace with other people. There's a lot you can do. You can have a lot of grace for them. You can pray for them. One of the, the, the things that we need to do well is have your testimony ready to share. Can, if I, I'm going to ask you a question, and I want you to think seriously. Could you do this? Can you share your testimony in three minutes or less to a coworker on the spot? And if you can't, you need to figure out how you can. You need to practice in front of a mirror. You need to ask God, what should I say? What, what is your testimony? Why are you a Christian? What did Jesus do for you? I know what he did for me. What did he do for you? Because when he asks you to share that, that person that you share it with is going to be impacted. And the Holy Spirit is going to be able to speak through your testimony. You need to have your testimony ready. But not only do you need your testimony to be ready, you need to be not afraid. You should not be afraid of man. Fear of man is something. Fear of man is, it's real, it's hard, and it's something we need to think about. I was reading this week in 1 Samuel 15 and 16. And in 1 Samuel 15 and 16, it talks about the first king, Saul. Saul, who did one thing right and then a whole bunch of things wrong. And Samuel, who was the prophet at the time who anointed Saul king, and he tells Saul what to do. Saul goes out and screws it up over and over. One one particular battle, he went and killed these people, but instead of killing the king and all the sheep and the cattle and all of that stuff, he brought the king back and he brought all the good sheep and cattle and everything back. Samuel shows up and says, what have you done? You were, you were given direct instructions to do what God told you to do, and you didn't do it. And he replies that, um, he said, I was afraid of the people and did what they demanded. Fear of man. And then Samuel calls him on it and says, are you kidding me? Do you think so little of yourself? You were, a, you're anointed king. You're afraid of the people? You're the king. As I was reading that, I, I, I just was struck. I just was like, so my, what I heard the Lord say to all of you, do you think so little of yourself? You're a Christian. You're a Christ follower. You've been chosen to represent God in your workplace, in your family, to your friends. You've been chosen. Don't think little of yourself. Don't be afraid of what people will think of you. And then... <laughs> Samuel, or Samuel says that to Saul. Do you think so little of yourself? Saul replies with this. I know I've sinned, but please at least honor me before my elders. Are you kidding? <laughs> Didn't get it. Nope. Uh, thick head. I don't know. He's not getting it. Samuel leaves Saul, and he's never going to see him again. And he grieves for Saul. He mourns for Saul. And then God says to Samuel, all right, stop whining over him. I'm done. We're done hearing about Saul. And he says, I want you to go to Jesse. Find the son of Jesse who's going to be my next king. And Samuel says, how can I do this? The king will kill me. Right? He has a 
really healthy fear of what the king can do. And God says, you know, you make a sacrifice and you go. And you know what Samuel did? He obeyed God. He was not, he did not let the fear of the king stop him from doing what God told him to do. We need to have that kind of obedience. We need to be obeying God, doing our work unto him, not complaining, being, having integrity, being willing to share our testimony. I, I had one situation a long time ago when I was working at the school. I went into this woman's classroom. I was in her classroom every day. And this one particular morning, I went in there, and she was a hot mess, okay? She was teary-eyed, ready to cry. It was just, it was not good. And I, I, we got through the class, and at the end of class, I said, wow, are, are, you, are you okay? You know, you, you seem really upset. And she's like, well, I, I just, and I said, how about, can I just pray for you? And she said, oh, yeah, she could pray for me. So I prayed for her. And I felt the Holy Spirit say, you need to share this part of your testimony. And so I shared with her about living with an addict. I, I didn't, I, I knew nothing. I, I knew nothing about this woman's life. I knew nothing about her background. And then she starts sobbing. And I'm like, okay, now I really did it. What did I do? And she shared with me that her son was addicted to heroin. And she was struggling, and he was having a hard time. And, and I, I shared with her my testimony. I wasn't afraid. Well, I was afraid, but I did it anyway. And then I ended up going to her house. I brought some friends with me. We went to her house, and we prayed for her son. Now, I, want, I, I would love to tell you I have 100 stories like that. I don't. But I have that one. That the Holy Spirit is working in her life. She goes to church now. Her kid is not on heroin anymore. It is, it's amazing that I got to be part of that because I was willing to be obedient. I was willing to do what God asked me to do. Step out in a public school and pray for somebody. When, you're ha- when you have these work relationships, not only do you need to be willing, but you need to be praying for them. Pray for your work. Pray when you get up in the morning. How can I use my testimony? What can I do today to share your love with others? You know, that story that I just told you, for me, is kind of like a mountaintop story. You know, I have lots of valley stories that I wasn't so good at what I was doing. I didn't, I got into debates with people and arguing religion and, and, and they walked away probably thinking Christians are crazy. Didn't do much for the cause at that point. But our everyday life is mostly in the field, right? We don't always get the mountaintops and we don't always get the valleys. <coughs> Excuse me. The day-to-day, the daily grind. Go to work, happy to work. Go to work. I'm going to do this unto the Lord. I'm going to work like he's watching me because he is. And don't give up. Don't, Don't give up. Don't feel like you know, it doesn't matter. It's not going to work. Nobody, there's never an opportunity. Don't, don't discount God and his planning and his timing. I love this quote. Your life may be the only Bible that people read. <laughs> 